it's hard to put together the call and the collect to asking God to preserve the work of his mercy, which of course means, among other things, us, the church. And that is always where we start. Who are we? We're a work of God's mercy. Mm. We're here not because we deserve it. We're here because out of God's great goodness, he chooses to call us to himself in great love. Pour out upon us the forgiveness that we do not deserve. Give us a place in eternity in all heaven, for which, unless he were to do it, we would not be fitted. And continuing to call us not just to an eternal destination, but to a purpose here on earth. And that's what's laid out, particularly in the colic. Preserve the works of your mercy. That, for what reason? That the church throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith, not in their own goodness, but in the confession of your name. In other words, the colic is asking God, we who are the objects of his mercy, that God might give us what we need to be able to persevere, which means don't give up. Don't say, Christianity, I guess it's for other people, it's not for me. Or to use the biblical language, to put my hand into the plow and choose to look back. That for what purpose? That I might be available, that we might be available for God to use us in the confession of his name. In other words, there is a missionary purpose for our availability. It, it has nothing, at least very little, to do with somehow God keeping me so that I'll make it to heaven. More importantly, it has to do with God working something in us so that he uses us for the proclamation of his kingdom, for the confession of his name. In other words, God is working it within me, God being my helper, the grace that I need to, stick, to persevere so that I might continue to be useful in God's purposes. It's not just for my own good, although it is that, but that it has everything to do with my availability, him wanting to do work through me in the lives of other people. And so the part of perseverance is not just a question of saying no to sin. It's also about saying yes and looking for the opportunities that God will put our way, put in our way to be available for him to use us. And as you know, they can come up in the most unlikely places. You just never know. Now, how does that get into or connect to all of this talk in the scriptures about division? Here's Jesus, you know, at his some of his most passionate. I came to bring fire on the earth. How I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized. And I'm under stress until it is accomplished. Do you think I have come to bring peace on the earth? No. And he lays out. Father against son. Mother against daughter-in-law. Three against two. Two against three. Two things are going on here. First of all, he's describing what it is that he is about to endure both using the analogy of fire and using the analogy of baptism. Fire has everything to do with the burning away of dross. Not that he needed to have dross burning away, but it's like the clearing of a path. He is moving forward and something powerful, literally cataclysmic, changing human history is about to happen and nothing is going to stand in its way. Baptism has to do with literally, what is it? It's going under the water, death to sin, and a new life. That's the whole meaning and purpose of baptism. Is Jesus doing that because he needs to die to sin? No, no, no. It has everything to do with him literally coming under the waters of God's judgment on behalf of all of us. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God and raised up. So he's doing something completely on our behalf, and that's what he's describing. Something he's doing on our behalf, something that's changing human history, bearing the judgment of God 
So, in fact, we are not under that same judgment. But what's the end result? The end result is God working something inside of us that causes us to cleave to Him. And to cleave to Him above all other loyalties. It's the absence of any partisanship except partisanship to Christ himself. God is doing something to literally make us holy and completely his own. And a part of the work that he does of perseverance is literally cutting away other loyalties. Working in us a kind of single-mindedness about devotion to him that literally lays aside any other partisan loyalties if they get in the way of our being loyal to Christ. And in fact, I would say that's probably the best analogy for perseverance. Because again and again and again, we come to these forks in the road. Which is more important? Is it my own financial well-being? Or is it persevering in the gospel? Is it me getting my own way? Or is it me being available for his way? If it's, maybe it's not wanting to, in essence, cause trouble. But sometimes the trouble is inevitable because of our greater loyalty to Christ. What's the line, make no peace with oppression? That can come in a lot of different ways. It can come from family. It can come from the church. It can come from our vestries. It can come from our friends. It can come from others who think their partisan preference should trump our loyalty. Perseverance has everything to do with seeing and finding ways for God to help us say yes when the fork in the road comes. This is not necessarily easy work. And we live in a world that in fact does its best to keep us sort of riding on the roller coaster, changing analogies rather, and not seeing what's coming. You see, that's actually a part of the fun or the terror, depending how you think about it. Mm -hmm. The roaster, roller coaster, a good roller coaster, quote unquote, doesn't let you know what's coming next, except to build anticipation. That's in some ways an apt analogy for me about what life feels like, not under the direction of Christ. Now, I love roller coasters. I like the adventure of it. But the fact of the matter is, is that there is a certain level of appropriate prayerful preparation for perseverance. I want to read you a quote. This is from David Bentley Hart's book, The Experience of God. He's, he's, this is his snapshot of our present culture. He says this, late modernity is, after all, a remarkably shrill and glaring reality, a dazzling chaos of the beguilingly trivial and terrifyingly atrocious. A world of ubiquitous mass media and constant interruption. A ceaseless storm of artificial sensations and appetites. An interminable spectacle whose only unifying theme is the imperative to acquire and spend. It's scarcely surprising in such a world amid so many distractions and so many distractions from distractions that we should have little time to reflect upon the mystery that manifests itself not as a thing among other things, but as the silent event of being itself. In other words, to live life like a roller coaster in some ways means that we're not prepared to persevere. We're making a decision to be carried along. And it takes a certain clarity to say, what do I need to work in my life so this doesn't describe me? Particularly the me in here. 
I can't remember who said it, but the quote is, nothing worth doing has ever been accomplished without solitude. The willingness to prepare, to ask God to give us the capacity to see our world as he sees it, so that we might get the true lay of the land, so that we might make the time in quiet before God, before his word, in his presence, to be able to walk with the kind of clarity and the kind of purpose that allows us to see clearly so we know how to let our yes be yes and our no be no. A part of the work that Hart is describing is building within us other places where we are connected with partisanship other loyalties. It can even be as simple as the eternal demanding God to always keep up with what's going on. So sisters and brothers, in this midst of this extraordinarily partisan season in which we find our country, can we find a way to both be and to call our people to the highest loyalty the highest place of partisanship. And find a way to live that out together in a way that expresses a loyalty and a unity that is above all others. Amen. Amen.